This program is brought to you by Emory University. So, um, first of all, I want to thank you both, Alice and Pearl, for being here. It's an honor to share this space and this moment with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, um, I know that you two are friends, but that you don't get to see each other very often. So can you just tell us a little bit about how long you've known each other and maybe tell us about your first encounters with each other, either in person or on the page? Oh, wow. She's assuming you have good memories. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why don't you take that um, Well, I... I can't remember the first time we actually met face to face. Um, I remember um, reading The Color Purple and having it raise all kinds of questions for me, which at the time I gave all the wrong answers to, um, which is really wonderful because I knew they were the wrong answers and I was mad because I knew they were the wrong answers. So I had to go back and read the book, think about it some more, go back and read the book and think about it. And I appreciated that about Alice then and I appreciate it about her now. Because whenever I get cocky and think I am just really doing it and telling the truth and all of that, then I read something that Alice has written and I say, oh man, I have to do more. I have to tell more. I have to go deeper into what the reason is that I'm writing in the first place. So I, I remember the, her work um, immediately because it made me think about things. I also remember that when I first started traveling around as a writer, talking to people and having to fly around and all that, I was terrified because I had never done that kind of work before. And I needed a way to get through all of those things that I was doing. And I had seen Alice on tour. So I would, my husband would let me out at the airport and I would say to myself, okay, what would Alice Walker do? And I didn't know her then. <laughs> so I assumed that she was the coolest woman in the world and would know exactly what to do. Which so is I true. Would, so I would go through the airport. I would not allow myself to be afraid because I would be thinking about what would she do. So that even before I met her, she was like the person that I held up to help me get through all these um, touring things. I think the nice thing about actually getting to know someone that you have um, admired from afar because of their work or because of the kind of person that you think they are, that it's really a wonderful gift when you actually get to meet the person and know them and talk with them, that it doesn't become something over there where you say, what would Alice do? It's like, okay, this is my friend. And it's a, it's a different kind of feeling. It's a really um, wonderful feeling that you have read this person correctly. So that, you know, I was trusting her to help me get through the airport because I'm afraid of flying. But it was really much bigger than that in terms of what I have learned from knowing her, from reading her work, and continue um, to learn that way. So, you know, I'd really appreciate it um, more all the time. And you are the reason that my papers are here in the first place. Because when you were writing Wrapped in Rainbows, you were so excited one day early on because you had found a grocery list of Zoras. And you were really excited because this was primary material. And I said, this is really not good, that this is what's going to be left of what we know of her. I don't want that to be what people know of me. And Valerie said, well, then you need to collect your papers and put them somewhere so that biographers will have a place to go. So it was, she was so, you know, she did not indulge me for a minute. She was like, well, no, then do something. And then I talked to Rudolph, who, you know, really was, was that same kind of voice. Um, and then when Alice put her papers here, I figured if Alice was safe here, I was safe here. So, but it, it really started with Valerie and that grocery list because I said, that would be terrible to go down in history and they're going to look at what I bought at the Publix on any given day. We want to see it all. That's right. Even the grocery list, but Even not the just the grocery list. Well, what I remember about you before I met you was that someone told me how much you disliked the color purple. Yeah. <laughs> and they just said you just went off on That was a people in Karis probably. Can Probably. Uh, Here, take this one. I know this one is. Maybe it'll work. We can How is it now? No? This Try this. Yeah, I heard. I heard that Pearl didn't like the color purple, and I said to myself, "Well, gee, I wonder why." And uh, I was, you know, I I'd hoped you would like it. But uh, if, since you didn't, I, that was fine. Uh, and then over time, I kind of, you know, noticed that you were looking deeply into gender issues. 
And I really felt that you uh, were changing a lot when I saw the book, Mad at Miles. And you know this book, Mad at Miles, where, where she wants to scratch up all his records and, you know, scratch him up too if she could find him. Uh, because of his, his sexism. I mean, we all love his music. What a musician. Oh, my goodness. What a wonderful, just a beautiful. And what a beautiful man, you know, just absolutely exquisite, but such a sexist. Um, and his treatment of um, Sicily, you know, and this was so painful. And I loved it that you just took that on, that you took it on, you took on, you know, how he was, and also how disappointed you were. And in writing about it so honestly and so deeply and, and just letting your, I mean, some of those pages are flaming with rage. Uh, I thought, wow, you know, we are meeting uh, in this territory where men abuse women and they must be um, called on this. Sexism has to be addressed. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> I have a little bit of a cold. <clears throat> so um, I think that was how we, we almost uh, met. And then I realized that every time I've been earlier on when I would come to Atlanta, it was your, your father's temple, I think, that, I, that would always invite me, the, the temple of the Black Madonna. Uh, I was always invited there. And for a long time, it was the only place in Atlanta that would have me. And I felt so at home there. And, and I didn't really connect you with it for a good while because I don't think you were there. Were you ever there? You were there? Oh, okay. Um. <laughs> but it was just, you know, it was just such a great place. And, and I really appreciated the, you know, being in a temple and having that kind of vibe um, because a lot of the work that we do in the world is priestessing. You know, it is... Um, you know, the, the, the uh, development of a new religion, actually, a new spirituality, a very ancient one, actually, but we're bringing it back uh, because the ones that, uh, you know, we are sometimes born into really don't serve us well. And it takes a lot of bravery to interrogate the religion that you inherit. So I was always very interested in finding out how other people are looking at this most elemental, fundamental place, you know, where, where is my spirit free? And where is my spirit uh, able to be in communion with other free spirits? It's crucial to have such places. So that was a bit of how I came to, to know you as much as I do know you. Uh, and when we finally really met, we instantly liked each other. You know, and I like your husband, too, um, which is really nice, you know, because sometimes, you know, you like the wife, you don't like the husband. You like the husband, you don't like the wife. Um, so, so I feel, you know, really lucky that we have met, and I, I just went to see your play uh, night before last. So was it last night? When was the last? It was night before last night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. It's great, and, and it just made me... Uh, so happy that someone is writing about that particular time and those issues. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about that, Alice, about your response to Pearl's play. What did it make you think about and what did it make you feel? Well, it, it, there's so many parallels. I remember when I was uh, living in Mississippi uh, in this very illegal marriage to this wonderful lawyer uh, who, who was, as they used to say, of the opposite race. <laughs> Um, you know, it was very uh, challenging to, to actually be together when he was so utterly committed to the changing of the society. I mean, he, de he and the, his, his law firm desegregated legally the school system of Mississippi, I mean, the, the segregated school system. That took every minute of his time, and it was terrible for our marriage. So when I was looking at, what, you know, at your play, I could see that, you know, just, just how, um, and it's, a, it's a, an area that I think most people don't even think about when, when you are in a relationship, a partnership, marriage, or whatever, uh, and you are with someone who is uh, caught up 
in changing society. I mean, you're caught up changing it too, but in a different way. And as women, we reserve, because we are often more often in the house, we reserve a part of our lives for the development of relationships. But it's a lot to try to take on an entire uh, state and an entire country that is racist uh, and to, to change it. And so, you know, so many of our marriages uh, were sacrificed. I mean, we, we married good people, um, but the marriages were sacrificed and often our children suffered. Um, and I often think, for instance, about the, the, the little kids who were the ones sent to literally integrate the schools of, in the South. The, the sacrifices that they made, I, mean, I, I don't know if there are any books yet written about some of those children, how early some of them died. You know, they, they gave more than any child should be expected to give. Um, but, but these are the kinds of sacrifices. And so what I, I so loved was that with your couple, they were able to, you know, go through that passage where they separated. And then he was able to, to understand, you know, the sacrifice and to realize that what he wanted was to be, you know, next to her. And um, I think that's the beginning of wisdom. So if you haven't seen it already, Pearl's play, What I Learned in Paris, is at the Alliance Theater through October 6th. Just through the 6th, so you've been warned. You have about a week to get there. It's wonderful. It is. It's delightful. Um, Pearl, how would you say you and Alice are in conversation with each other through your work? sometimes similar, sometimes not um, exactly the same, but I think that since we're looking at some of the same issues, since we're looking at gender, since we're looking at race, since we're looking at citizenship, I think that there are, um, are things that we look at that bring those um, forward. One of the, the problems that I had understanding the color purple was that as a child, as a, a young person raised in a very black nationalist household, there was no other narrative allowed in the discussion. We talked about race, and we always mm. talked about race. And it was a very uh, positive, empowering thing because I grew up with a, with a race track, mm -hmm. not race track, but a track <laughs> on, going through my, um, through my mm. life so that I was very clear about that. But I didn't um, really think about feminism, think about gender, think about sexism mm. until I was in my 20s, going into my 30s, so that the whole idea of encountering a book like The Color Purple, where gender was very much up front in the book, and where the, the black male character who was beating and abusing um, this woman was very much up front, and her stepfather, who had abused her in all kinds of ways, very much up front. All of that that I knew to be true smacked up against my black nationalism, which is we don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. We only talk about race. We do not talk yeah. about gender because when we talk about race, we can all unite together, black men and black women. We can stand on the side and say, these white folks are doing this. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about gender, then that makes it different. How do you have a conversation with the same person you've been fighting for when now all of a sudden you're saying to this one, no, you are also an oppressor. You are oppressed, but you are oppressing me in these ways because of gender. Very difficult conversations. My father was one of the most progressive men I knew about race, and never until he passed was I able to have a conversation with him about gender. Mm -hmm. And finally, when he was about 85, I said, you know what? I'm not going to spend the last years of my father's life arguing with him about gender. We're going to go to the movies. We're going to talk about something else. Mm -hmm. Because I valued all that he had taught me, and I wanted to be with him. So that I had to say to myself, OK, this is not my role to educate my father about this. But all the rest of the men I knew, they were on their own. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciated the color purple for that, because it forced me to deal with the fact that you can't be a black person on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then a black woman on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, mm -hmm. and then take Sunday off. You have to be what you are every minute of every day. Mm -hmm. And once you can do that, then you can write about the things that you're talking about that you saw in Paris, you know, which is, okay, how do you balance that? 
being a warrior for your race and also being a warrior for gender. And then finally realizing that you're really trying to be a warrior for human beings, mm -hmm. for people, for humans. Doesn't matter where they live, doesn't matter what they are, that you're really talking about humanity. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think for me that that started, that opening up of it doesn't just have to be racial, it doesn't just have to be black nationalism. Started for me with the color purple and continues. You know, I was not raised to think of myself as an American. And then I read Alice's book, and she has a thing in there that says, remember, you yourself are America. And I, this was before President Obama was elected, and I said, she's doing it again. I'm not an American. I'm in, in opposition to America. I was raised to be adversarial, all of that. And then Barack Obama got elected. And it changes everything, because now the president looks like family. Mm -hmm. How can you say, I'm on the outside when he's on the inside with Michelle and Sasha and Malia and Bo and the grandmother and everybody? <laughs> you can't do it. So that the, the thought of being an American was something that I really valued in, in the work that Alice was doing at that moment, because it spoke to me in a way that I really needed in order to open up to the fact that I am an American. This is the only country that I've got. And I, I want to understand what that means. And it's a very new thought for me. My husband laughs at me and says, you know, you're a, a new American because you just realized you were a citizen mm -hmm. four <laughs> years ago. But it's really true. So it's a, it's a whole big uh, canvas that I'm looking at that has all kinds of different questions on it. But it, it really, I think, started for me by being so mad at Alice for writing The Color Purple. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's right. And I thank you for that. I do. I've uh, joked with Pearl before that she should start a Pearl Clegg School of Manhood in terms <laughs> of training uh, men to be, you know, feminist men and womanist men. So um, both of you have spent your whole careers writing about um, free women and the men who are free enough to love them. So. Tell us a little bit about what being a free woman means to you. How do you define that? How do you live that day to day? You, are, you both are two of the freest women I know. <laughs> Probably two of the freest women on the planet, right? So how do you, how do you um, conceptualize that in your life? Uh, I would like to say, before we go there, uh, that I think of myself as an American um, at a much more basic level than citizenship. Uh, I think of myself as, you know, I'm Native American, African, and, and um, European. Those are the three lineages. And they came together uh, before, I think they probably were, you know, some of them were here before the country. Uh, so I am of the earth. I am of this territory. I am of this place. Uh, and the country may come and go, and I am still here. I mean, this is still where I am. Uh, and I think actually part of my sense of freedom comes from that, uh, that I am free to be all that I am, uh, including all of the, you know, the people who were not good people, I mean, in, in the, by their acts, uh, and also the people who were amazing people by their love of the earth and by their love of nature, um, by their understanding of tradition, by their, you know, their ceremonies, by their belief, you know, in, in the world. Um, and, and in the African-American strain, you know, there is this yearning always in us to be free. You know, and it wasn't to be free just of white people. You know, I, I think it's such a limited notion that you just want to be free of white people. Uh, after the white people have, you know, forgotten all about you, then what you going to do, you know? Um, and so I, I, I really, uh, for me, it, it's just indivisible, this, this desire. Uh, I cannot, because of that, I, I cannot abuse myself in any way because I see it as, a, as an enslavement of some kind. Uh, and so that is it. That is the foundation of, of my freedom. And I just keep, you know, and I, it's one of the reasons I don't fear dying. Because how can dying uh, be anything but the most extreme freedom? Uh, because you, 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 your elements that are just exactly the elements of the earth go back to the earth. And then you recycle 
through the the atmosphere, the clouds and and the the you know the trees and the the creatures and uh, infinitely and forever. Um, and so that freedom is 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 part of the continuum, you know, that I feel. I mean, I feel this every day. Um, that you know, my my responsibility as a being of the planet really is to be free. I mean, beyond writing, beyond raising a child, beyond, you know, having lovers or a husband or any of that, uh, you know, why can't I be like uh, the rose bush? Why can't I be like the rabbit? Why can't I be, uh, you know, like the fox? Why can't I be like the clouds? Why can't I be like the rivers? Why can't I be like the ocean? Why can't I be what I am? And to be what I am is to be free. <coughs> Um, I think for me, the, uh, the essence of it, of trying to be free, um, is not to lie. Um, lying is a big question for me because I feel like I spent a long time learning how to really get good at it, and I don't want to be good at it. I don't want to do it about anything. So that I'm at the, at the point of saying, okay, is this the truth? Whatever you're doing, whatever you're writing, whatever you're living, is this the truth? And if it's the truth, I think I'm okay. Excuse me. Thank you. Do you want to add anything? Okay. Well, I would, I would just like to second what she's saying because I think that that, that is right. I think part of what has happened uh, to us as a, as a culture and as, as a society is that we have uh, learned to live with lies. And the more you live with lies, the farther off course you go because the only uh, way of staying, you know, in, in, in the right path uh, is to have truth as your foundation. Um, so I agree very much with, with, with Pearl. So um, how has your understanding and practice of creativity changed over the years and over the decades? Well, uh, in what sense do you mean? When you think of yourself as a creative person, mm -hmm. and we know your creation, your creative work, mm -hmm. as a writer, but how has your sense of your own creativity changed and shifted over the decades? Well, uh, I don't know how many of you are writers or painters or artists of you know whatever kind, but you know when you're really young and you may write a poem or paint a painting or create a, a work of art, there's always that sense that, well, maybe this is all there is. And, and there's a period when you honestly, well, I speak for myself, there was a period after my first collection of, of poetry that I thought, and the publisher was saying, well, will you write a novel? I looked at him and I thought, really? Where would it come from? <laughs> and because I, ha I, I, didn't, I didn't see it in myself. I didn't feel it in myself. You know, I didn't. And part of it was I didn't then have a practice um, that, that was focused on um, creating the space for, for whatever I, I was to create to appear. Uh, but lucky for me, I got a scholarship to go to Peterborough, uh, New Hampshire, uh, to the McDowell Colony. And that's a place where you get a little cabin in the woods uh, and they will, they will leave you alone, and, and they'll actually bring your lunch to your door every day, uh, but not even knock on your door. They'll just leave it there quietly. And so you have all of this, this internal space. And I took with me a lot of um, music by people like uh, Clara Ward and Bessie Smith and uh, Rosetta Tharp, and, you know, and I'd just be out there in, the, in that little cottage in the snow and listening to these voices that actually carry so much power for us. We are so, you know, absolutely blessed to have all of these people who've been singing all of these centuries. I mean, it, it is just an amazing transmission of energy that they give. Um, and so I made the space and I started to write this novel, which was The Third Life of Grange Copeland. Um, and then after that, you know, I, I realized that I was 
you know, getting into a kind of habit. I was making a space every day to work. And when I moved to Mississippi, we bought a little house uh, from Marion Wright Edelman, who was a, a lawyer there who had employed my husband. And I made this beautiful study to, to create in. Uh, and I started writing a novel called Meridian. And part of it was just this sense that when you give everything you have, in fact, Quincy Jones used to talk about this, how you go to the bottom of the well and you basically get all the water and you even start sort of sucking around at the, at the very bottom uh, and, and you just give everything you have to whatever it is you're doing because that primes the pump and it starts it again. But you may not know that, you know, for a while. Uh, so that is how it changed. And so over time, over all of these years of, of writing books and, you know, doing all the other things, there, there developed this sense of faith and also the sense of serenity because, you know, if it comes, I am grateful. If it doesn't come, you know, I have other things I can do. Do you, do you have a uh, particular writing process that, that you employ um, and how has that changed or evolved over the years? Well, <clears throat> I, I fell in love with this law student, so he had a lot of those long legal pads, you know, those yellow pads. And so the, in the beginning, everything I wrote was on those pads because I would just go to his office and take, you know, a whole stack. Uh, but, but I also started, you know, just typing up everything, and I had a little Smith Corona typewriter, um, and eventually, you know, got my computer. It, it evolves, you know. I mean, you don't, it's, it's almost like you don't notice it. Uh, you learn how to use one thing, and then you learn how to use something else, and, you know, now I use my laptop, and it just seems perfectly natural to do. Um, and I suppose if something else is created, I'll learn to use that. How are you doing, Pearl? All right. Good. Good. Yay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've been talking about my play nonstop all mm -hmm. over town for a month, and it caught up with me yesterday, but I was not, not going to be here. Mm -hmm. So excuse me for mm -hmm. sounding so gross. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You sound great always. You do. You Thank sound you. fine. OK. So Pearl, do you want to talk a little bit about your writing process and how it's changed or evolved over the years? Sure. Um, it's actually pretty much the same. Um, I, don't, I don't use a computer to write with. I write everything by hand. I always have. Um, because I used to make a living as a typist, and I type really fast. And if I'm typing, then my brain will adjust to the speed of my hands so that the word will be whatever my hands will type, as opposed to if I'm writing, then I take it, take the hand off, and then the real word will come um, to me. So I always write everything by hand. Um, I like to use different color inks just because it's fun to use different color inks. Um, I like to write at home. People sometimes romanticize writing in hotels, I can't do that at all. I have to be home. You know, I have to have my cat walking across the desk and all of that. Um, so I like to work in a place that's familiar to me. Um, and I always try as hard as I can not to take more than a year on any big thing, like a year for a book, a year for a play, just because I think if I give myself unlimited time, then I'll just procrastinate and, and say, well, it could be better, it could be, as opposed to saying, no, do that one, and then do another one, and then do another one. Um, so I'm always trying to make myself not get stuck because I'm trying to make every line perfect, but to assume that I'll learn whatever I'm trying to learn in this piece and go to the next one so that at the end of my life, there'll be a body of work that will show that growth, but enough for people to look at and say, oh, she went from here to here, you can see it. So that I'm always trying to work as fast as I can um, and tell the truth every time, not to say, great, I learned that last time, let me write about that three more times but to say, okay, you know that, now what? Now what, what's the next question? And the next one, but I really love the process. I know a lot of writers who hate the process. They love the book once it's done. They love the play when it's on the stage, but they hate to have to stop talking about the book and go write it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I really like the process. I like talking about it, but I like the actual sit down and, and put it on the paper. I like all of that. I would just add too that uh, everything that I write, 
I, I know is given to me to write. And that that is, you know, my responsibility. Um, and that no one else could do it. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason I feel so connected to the ancestors when I'm working. Uh, that they know that my particular ancestry, my particular lineage, um, is able to do certain things in literature. Uh, and that that's also one of the reasons I was educated. Because I come from a very poor family and it was very difficult uh, for you know eight of us to be educated, so eight of us were not. I mean, I have a sister who went uh, through college and a brother who went uh, two year, through two years of college. But I, I have really felt very strongly that uh, I, I have, you know, a real responsibility to create the things that I do. So talk a little bit more about that knowing that you feel in terms of knowing that you're supposed to write the things that come to you to write. And, and for both of you, if you can talk a little bit about how meditation or other spiritual practices play into your sense of creativity. Um, well, I think um, for me, meditation has been crucial because it, it provides that space uh, where I can listen to my inner guide and I'm not, um, I'm not tempted to listen to any outside advice or source. I feel completely connected to um, uh, you know, wh what the directive is from, from, from me. But, but not just from me, me as, as, you know, as I am today, um, but the me of, you know, hundreds of years ago. Um, and I do feel that connection. And I always have, from a little child, I have had a real good understanding that I am very connected to people and spirits, the spirits of those people, going back, you know, in time. So when I meditate, it is a blissful reunion uh, with ancestors and with, uh, you know, people who may not be in my particular lineage in a physical sense, but who are definitely a part of my spiritual lineage. And we celebrate, you know, we celebrate in all kinds of ways. I was explaining to somebody recently how my, my ancestors are so present in me, to me, that whenever I do political work, uh, that is, is challenging, and most of it is, they cheer, and I have a sense of them being really happy. You know, I, I almost hear them saying to me, gosh, you got up and you got on that boat, you know, and you did this and you did that, and, and we're really glad, you know. I mean, I feel that sense of, um, especially the ones who were, um, like the, the Native American ones who lost, you know, Georgia and, and um, a lot of the, the East Coast um, and, and who could not develop, you know, continue to develop as the people that they were. I, I feel them saying, uh, you know, you are standing still, you know, through you we, we are represented and also through the African American, the African ones. And also through the poor white ones, you know, I feel all of them. I feel that's the sense that um, somehow I have been able to carry all three of these lineages uh, in a way that the, the best of them would really be grateful for. And that makes me very happy. I think I feel that more strongly um, about my mother specifically because my mother was very unhappy about a lot of aspects of her life. And I think one of those was that she married into a very black nationalist family and was never able to find that balance I was talking about earlier. So I watched my mother trying to talk to my father about gender issues, although they wouldn't have described them that way, and then later trying to talk to my stepfather about gender issues, and never could get them to embrace a language to even have the discussion. 
So my mother was kind of, you know, very dramatic. She would be somewhere in the house talking to my stepfather. And, you know, you close the door and you can hear people whispering. You know they're arguing, of course. But then she would come out and come out and fix dinner and we would sit, sit there for dinner, except she would have sunglasses on because she'd been crying. Now, we all knew she had been crying. She had on sunglasses in the middle of the afternoon, but you couldn't say anything about it. She never said anything about it. But it was always, for me, as a, as a young woman, I wanted her to not be sitting there looking miserable with sunglasses on. I wanted her to fuss out loud in front of us and say, what is it that is making you feel like this? But that wasn't the way she was. That wasn't the way their marriage, either marriage, was arranged. So I often feel... Um, very much uh, that my mother is glad that I'm doing the work that I'm doing, especially once I started talking about gender. Um, when I was talking solely about race, I always felt my father was, was very much pleased. Um, even though I was a daughter and not a son, I was as close as he was going to get, so that that was good. Um, but my mother, I think, more when I started writing, with, with Matt at Miles, actually, I think that my mother was very uh, present in me just talking about these things. And also my daughter, because when my daughter became old enough to be out and about in the world, I remember being terrified that I hadn't told her everything I thought she needed to know, especially about dangerous things, because I had inherited those sunglasses as a gene so that I didn't talk about having been abused. I didn't talk about how I got in that situation. I never talked to her about it, and I remembered watching her walked down the walkway, 16 years old. I made her wait till she was 16 to go out. She was going out, the young man opened the door and they got in the car and drove away. And I said, oh my God, I haven't told her what to look for. And that's where Mad at Miles came from because I wanted to write it down for her and say, this is what happened. If this happens, don't do this. If this happens, get out of the car. If this happens, if you hear this tone of voice, think about it this way. Because I didn't want her to be unprepared because my mother, I don't think ever had any kind of um, domestic violence um, or violence from men that she knew. So I don't think that that ever was something that she could talk to me about, felt like she needed to talk to me about. But I knew better because I had been in a terrible relationship and just had not talked to my daughter about it. And I felt like I had done her a disservice. So I wrote one of the pieces in Mad at Miles and gave it to her. And she really liked it. So she took it to school and showed it to some of her girlfriends. And so they wanted to know, could she get them a copy? Because their mother had never talked to them about this stuff either. So she started Xeroxing it and giving it to people. And then their mothers would thank me because they didn't know how to talk about it to their daughters. So it became, Mad at Miles, I think, came from that desire to make sure that all of us watching our daughters go out into the world could at least, if we didn't know how to have that discussion, could hand them something and say, read this and we'll talk, you know, or something um, where we can start those discussions. So I think my mother on one end and my daughter on the other, and now I've got three granddaughters and a grandson, so I really want to tell them everything. <laughs> my daughter keeps saying, they're three, they're five, you know, don't, <laughs> just wait, don't tell them everything. It's like, no, they're eight now, they need to know, they need to know. Do you have any uh, conscious rituals for bringing your mother in as someone you were writing to and for? I, I don't. I have, um, I have altars in my house. Uh, my husband always laughs. Any open surface is going to be an altar in the next 10 minutes. Um, so I have lots of stuff, photographs and charms and, you know, plants and things around. But I don't, I don't do any conscious calling in of, of anyone. I try consciously to call in my own um, resolve to tell the truth, you know, just to say, okay, listen to what you're saying. You know, make sure that you're not skimming over something where you're, you know, you're just not trying to say it because it makes you look a little wobbly on something. You know, tell the wobbly part because if you're wobbly, everybody else is wobbly too. And then we can get a little closer, a little closer. So it's, it's less a question of a moment of calling in anybody specific, but just realizing that it's valuable to people to encounter the truth, you know, which is one of the reasons I really love theater. Because if you do a good play and people respond to it, you can see them encountering the truth you were trying to tell them. Um, and if they laugh where you thought it would be funny, if they gasp when you thought they'd be surprised, it's really wonderful because you know it's working. You know, with a book, you kind of hope that it is, but you don't see people encounter it in groups of 800. You know, you just don't. So that it's, it's really wonderful to, to try to push yourself to tell the truth and then see that other people are relieved to see that same question examined and some idea put forward. There's a, a moment in the play where one of the guys um, 
is blustering at these two women and he says, he's talking to them about buying a house and he doesn't want them to buy a house where they're gonna buy it. And he's finally out of patience and he says, I forbid you to buy this house. And you can feel the people in the audience kind of gasp like, oh my God, this is so terrible. And then there's a beat and then both of the women just fall out laughing. They don't even care. The whole idea that he would think he could forbid them is just funny, they laugh, they laugh, which of course drives him crazy because he was looking for something to push against, looking for something, some kind of argument. And because they were free, they didn't have to argue about it. You know, he can't, you can't forbid a free person. You know, you just can't do it. And I think that those kinds of moments in, in this place specifically, because it's my most recent thing, I've been just really pleased to see moments like that where we don't have to go toward freedom in the defiant mode. I've written a lot of pieces where the person is defiant. Don't tell me what I can do, I will do what I wanna do. And I love to write that scene. But I also love when the person won't even encounter that. It's like, please, get out of here. You know, we're gonna do what we're gonna do. And that's new for me. So I have loved watching that moment and watching people in the, in the audience respond to it. And watching the men who in the audience are obviously people who have been known to forbid, they kind of hang their heads up. <laughs> Is that, and the woman next to him is doing this. Like, do I sound like that? Because if you can hear yourself yeah. and what you really do on the stage, it's like a safe kind of space for you to see how absurd you are doing that. And it's, that's really fun to, to let people encounter it in community so we can all laugh at that tone. And then next time it comes up, you can say, remember how silly that looked on the stage? That's how you sound now, don't do that. You know? And then you have a place to start that discussion without sunglasses. You know? <laughs> So this brings me to my next question. I mean, you both are known for writing in multiple genres. So, Pearl, how do you decide if something you want to write is going to be a play or a novel? And Alice, how do you decide if it's going to be a poem or a short story or an essay? Or do you decide? Does the work decide it for you? Well, uh, the work decides uh, because if you are patient, and you do not try to force anything. Um, in my experience, what is, is wanting to be expressed will find its own expression, its own way of being expressed. So some things will be very short, some things will be you know, like a poem, some things will be obviously a short story. And then sometimes if you um, are, you know, sort of um, kept company by uh, a storyline, uh, you, you start to realize it wants to be a novel. And in my experience, what is required is that you find uh, the space, the time, the funding, or whatever it is that you need to bring these uh, gifts out into the open. Uh, and of course, novels are the most expensive because there you need at least a year or two. And if you are a single mother or a working um, person, uh, you really have to, to juggle a lot to come up with a year in which you can just write uh, whatever the novel might be. Uh, the Color Purple took exactly a year to write but it took um, much longer than that to change my life so that I could get to that year. And the Temple of My Familiar, which came after The Color Purple, took two years because it's a much bigger book. Um, and it was you know, just an absolute joy to live in that space. But I did have to, to you know, settle in uh, to have that period of, of two years uh, to, to do it just the way it needed to be done. I feel very uh, sad for writers who, you know, are carrying around uh, uh, the egg that is the story and trying to find the nest and trying to, to feed the birds, you know, little birds they already have, you know, running around. And, and they discover that they cannot, that they, they cannot afford the space, they cannot afford the year or the two years you know, this is such a criminal thing to do to an artist. Uh, one of the lovely things I discovered in Brazil, I was just down in Brazil, which I, I really like a lot, is that they have somehow uh, attached the, you know, the, the well-being of the artist to the gross national product. 
so that there's always income for the artist and no artist has to starve and no artist has to take terrible jobs that you know kill the spirit and exhaust the body <clears throat> and flatten the gift you know art is so crucial for the development of any society that we should just be begging our artists to let us help them because they are bringing the gift of actual growth and understanding and you know development uh, and art is not understood in this way in this country is more a commodity that you just have as a snack and then you go on and do something else uh, but you're not really fulfilled you're just you know you just had a, a candy bar uh, and this is you know this is one of the things that um, in fact our culture used to have more of black culture African American culture we used to have culture and we used to really um, devote a lot of energy to it and time to it and caring about it because somehow it was very clear to us that it was our only weapon you know and, and it was weapon is a not quite the right word but you know what I mean I mean it was it was a way to fight the oppression because you had the spirit of your creativity which was affirmed by your community and everybody could see how each other was growing, you know, how, how each person uh, had part of the gift that we were trying to deliver. Um, and I, I hope that this is something that uh, our whole culture can, can understand and care about so that you won't continue to have the same old plays, you know. I mean, I'm so happy to have your play because often what you notice is that they just keep trotting out the same old tired dead plays and songs, you know, that once might have moved somebody and, you know, <laughs> made a bundle of money, uh, but gee, are they dead and should be buried uh, or at least kept on ice for like 40 years until they seem new again. So, <clears throat> You know, I, I, just, I just feel that, that, you know, to understand culture, you know, culture is about what makes you healthy. Culture is like planting, um, you know, seeds in soil that is rich. I mean, that is to, cult to cultivate, you know, that, that culture for human beings is like that. It keeps us healthy. And we really should have it as a, a very high priority in the society, rather than as just something that you go to, to sit and watch on the weekend. Because it's all about spirit. And if you have a culture that has no spirit, you don't have a culture. How do you answer that question? How do you know if it's a play or a, a novel, or does it tell you? Um, I think it kind of tells you for the, um, there's only a certain number of characters, a certain number of scenes you can do in a play. So that if you have a great big story with lots of people in it, it's going to be harder to fit that on the stage. Um, so that would tend to be something I would think of more, this needs to be a book. But I'm, I'm trained as a playwright, and theater is really what I what I lean toward because I like the fact that you have the writing time when you have to be by yourself. But once you've written the play and you go into rehearsal, it's all community, it's all collaboration, it's all working with other artists on making this thing become a real thing. And then at the end you invite real people in to see whether or not you did it right. So I love all of the um, collaboration and family that comes about um, in plays. So that I, I think that if I had to choose, that's I'm always trying to see if I can make the story fit um, onto the stage because I like the, I like the process of it, um, of putting it together and then of sitting in the back of the theater and knowing immediately whether or not it works or whether or not it doesn't because you can hear it. You know, you know when it's working and when it isn't. With a book, you put it out there and hope that it is. But you don't get that same immediate response from the people who experience it. So I, I think that um, plays are probably where my heart is uh, mostly, but sometimes the stories too to, doesn't lend itself, you know, there's too many settings, so you have to say, okay, how can I tell this another way? The other thing is that I had been writing plays for a long time before I ever wrote a novel, 
And in a play, I could say, it's a beautiful summer afternoon in Harlem in 1930. And then I go on. Because the set designer and the costume designer and the lighting designer have to make it a beautiful summer afternoon in Harlem. <laughs> then the actors come, and they bring all the gifts they have. If I'm a novelist, I can't say it's a beautiful afternoon in Harlem. I have to make you see it. I have to, so I have to be the costume designer. I have to be the lighting designer. I have to be all those people. And for me as a playwright, that was very intimidating when I first started. You know, I kept looking around for somebody who's going to fill this in. You know, what are you going to do? Um, but I, I like the challenge of, of making it all work, of being all the designers in a novel and making sure that what is on that page is actually what you want. And then people get what you did on that page. With a play, the danger is always that you'll have a director or actors or designers who don't share the vision that you have. And then that's really difficult. That's a nightmare. Because you're always trying to pull them in another direction and they don't really get it. But if you have people who understand what you're trying to do and are prepared to work with you, then I think um, it's just a wonderful way for people to bring creative gifts that the playwright may not have, you know, to say, I can make this such a beautiful summer afternoon, and then they show you how to do it. I'm always in awe of the designers who make these things look like what they're supposed to look like. So that, that, that part of it, I think, for me in theater is the, is the most enjoyable, that we're all trying to do it together. So you both have placed your papers here at Emory, and um, I've seen your, how many boxes, Pearl? I saw them as you were packing them up, 100? <laughs> it's 100 and something. Yeah. yeah. And um, I've heard about the go-go boots in your collection, uh, Alice. I haven't seen them yet, but Rudolph told me about the go-go <laughs> boots. So I wanted, to <laughs> I wanted to ask, what are the, the hidden jewels in your archives that you think some super sleuth uh, biographer or researcher will find in, who knows, 20 years or so? Or if there's anything in your papers, in what you gave to Emory, that you had a hard time letting go because of the memories they carried for you? Well, it's always sobering to go back and read stuff that you wrote in a journal or in a letter when you were about 25. Um, or 18, or you know, all of those years where you were discovering things. It's, it's really interesting to go back and look at that. But I think probably the most interesting thing um, to me is just the letters. I have lots and lots of letters um, back and forth to my parents, um, to my sister, that kind of thing. But I don't, I don't really know how to judge that, you know, what's valuable in there. It's like, here it is, and I hope it's useful to somebody. But you know, you can. It was hard to kind of go through it and say, okay, let me just see what's in here without stopping to read every single thing. Mm -hmm. And that would, you know, I'd still be doing it. And on box five, I wouldn't be done. Mm -hmm. But I think that just the the idea of preserving um, the things that were important or that took you someplace, and hopefully that somebody will will find those useful. That's the thing that was nice for me to say. Okay, these are are things that I can take out of my basement, put somewhere, where when somebody looks at something I've written, they can go back and see if they can find a thread through it. But I'm, you know, I'm not at the moment where I'm trying to find that thread myself. I'm still adding to the, to the boxes. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't remember. I, don't, I never had go-go boots. He was wrong. Okay. Um, but I did live in a pair of boots and a pair of jeans, the same boots and the same jeans for about a decade. Um, and I wanted to leave those uh, uh, to people or to whoever, you know, just to have some idea of what the uniform was. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, I was, you know, traveling the world, I was raising a child, I was an activist, um, and that's what I wore because it was easy, you know, you could go through any climate, different climates with your boots, uh, the jeans, you could, you know, go from being on a picket line somewhere or in jail or uh, in your garden. I mean, you could just do all of that in one day. Um, and, you were, and you were dressed for it. So I wanted to leave a symbol of that kind of life, you know, that went on for oh, 15 or 20 years, you know, of just being really 
in the work, in the world, um, you know, not very concerned about what I was wearing, uh, which is such a relief. And, uh, and you know, it, it just so, but then the, the other part uh, of, of what is in there, you know, I've, ju I've just been looking, I've been, I'm here partly because I'm working on 40 years of journals. And I saw them for the first time in six or seven years yesterday. And all I could think was, what was I thinking? Mm. Why yeah. did I write all this? I mean, it's a lot, and it really just, um, but you know, but then I looked through some of it today, and I found some letters uh, that took me back to a time when, um, you know, there was this, I won't go into detail, but you know, I was in great, uh, you know, not quite distressed, but like, what is happening? I mean, what this is on such new territory, and and what does it mean? And you know, you know, you've been in these places, um, and and what I realized is I was reading it and and feeling, you know, the, the the questions I was having with myself and with you know two or three other people. That I went through that, I learned what I was, uh, why that was happening, what it was about. Uh, and it propelled me right into a whole other section of life where I was quite balanced and quite happy. Uh, so it was reassuring to see, you know, that, yeah, this is, this is a place where I honestly had no idea I had, I think this is when I just got a divorce and, you know, I was starting a whole other life in a whole other part of the world and, you know, and who knew what would happen. And, and you know, whatever happened did happen and now, you know, it, it had, you know, after that it had smoothed out and I had gone on. But this happens in every life. You reach mm. these places where you don't know what's happening. You know, you have emotions, you have fears, you have anxieties, you have dreads, you have, you know, all of that. You, you, just, you know, but you, you, you grow through it. And that's so wonderful. Can I say yes. one thing? I've, I appreciated what you said earlier about being in Brazil and how they've tied support um, for artists to the, um, the government has approached it in a progressive way. And I, um, I just want to say that it's really important for all of us to think about voting on the 6th of November and that it's really important, yeah, it's critical for us to think about the people that we're electing as people who understand how important the arts are, how important culture is, um, because this is, I think this is such a critical election um, and that we all have to understand that every aspect of our lives is gonna be touched by what we do um, on the 6th. So I said to myself about a month ago, every time I'm with more than two people, I'm gonna make sure I say, I hope y'all are registered and you're gonna go vote because if you're prepared to spend an evening talking to us, an afternoon talking to us about art and culture and human beings, I think you'll probably be voting for the candidate who thinks about those things too. Um, so don't forget to vote and take somebody with you. That's my announcement for the day. Thank you. So, as you know, this is the 30th anniversary of the publication of The Color Purple. Eight, 1982, it came out. Can you believe it? So, to close us out, I've asked Alice to um, read a letter from Seeley. Uh, this is a letter in which Celie is describing Harpo after Sophia has left home. Uh, is, I don't know if you recall, but uh, he he found he started to uh, he started a juke joint, and she's she's writing about that. Dear God, the first week nobody come, second week three or four, third week one. Harpo sit behind his little counter listening to Swain pick his box. He got cold drinks, he got barbecue, he got chitlins, got store-bought bread. He got a sign saying Harpo's tacked up on the side of the house and another one out on the road, but he ain't got no customers. <laughs> <laughs> I go down the path to the yard, stand outside, look in. Harpo look out and wave. Come on in, Miss Seeley, he say. I say, no, thank you. Mister sometime walk down, have a cold drink, listen to Swain. Miss Shug walked down too every once in a while. She's still wearing her little shifts and I still cornrow her hair 
but it getting long now, and she says soon she won't impress. I put puzzled by Shug. One reason is she say whatever come to mind, forget about being polite. Sometimes I see him staring at her real hard when he don't think I'm looking. One day he say, nobody coming where I hear just to hear Swain. Wonder could I get the clean honey bee? I don't know, I said. She a lot better now, always humming or singing something. She'd probably be glad to get back to work. Why don't you ask her? Suge say, his play's not much compared to what she used to, but she think maybe she might grace it with a song. <laughs> Harpo and Swain got Mr. to give him some of Suge old announcements from out the trunk, crossed out the lucky star of Coleman Road, and put in Harpo's of blank plantation, stuck them on trees between the turn off to our road and town. The first Saturday night, so many folks come they couldn't get in. Shug, shug, baby, I thought you were dead. Five out of a dozen say hello to Shug like that. And come to find out, it was you, says Shug, with a big grin. At last, I get to see Shug Avery work. I get to watch her. I get to hear her. Mister didn't want me to come. Wives don't go to places like that, he say. Yeah, but Celie going, says Shug, while I press her hair. Suppose I get sick while I'm singing, she say. Suppose my dress come undone. She wearing a skin-tight red dress, look like the straps made out of two pieces of thread. <laughs> Mr. Mudder putting on his clothes. My wife can't do this. My wife can't do that. No wife of mine's. He go on and on. Sugar Avery finally say, good thing I ain't your damn wife. <laughs> he hushed then. All three of us go down to Harpo's. Mr. and me sit at the same table. Mr. drank whiskey. I have a cold drink. First, Shook sang a song by somebody named Bessie Smith. She said Bessie's somebody she know, old friend. It call a good man is hard to find. She look over at Mr. a little when she sing that. I look over at him too. For such a little man, he all puff up. Look like all he can do to stay in his chair. I look at Suge, and I feel my heart begin to cramp. It hurt me so, I cover it with my hand. I think I might as well be under the table for all they care. I hate the way I look. I hate the way I'm dressed. Nothing but church-going clothes in my shift robe. And Mr., looking at Suge's bright black skin and her tight red dress, her feet in little sassy red shoes, her hair shining in waves. Before I know it, tears meet under my chin. And I'm confused. He loved looking at Suge. I love looking at Suge. But Suge don't love, nobody, love looking at nobody but him. But that's the way it's supposed to be. I know that. But if that's so, why my heart hurt me so? My head droops so it near about in my glass. Then I hear my name. Suge saying, Seely, Miss Seely. And I look up there where she at. She said my name again. She said, this song I'm about to sing is called Miss Seely's Song. Because she scratched it out of my head when I was sick. First, she hummed it a little, like she do at home. Then she sang the words. It all about some no-count man doing her wrong again but I don't listen to that part. I look at her and I hum along a little with the tune. First time somebody made something and name it after me. Thank you all. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.